Let's continue our study in the Gospel of John. This video is chapter 13, verses 1 through 17, the story of the Lord Jesus washing the disciples' feet. So, the bigger picture here is that we have entered a new major section, and in this, this section actually goes through chapter 20, verse 31, the Lord is disclosing himself in his cross and his exaltation. We are now headed towards the cross, you might say, beginning here. So, the effort to bring sign and word to the nation so that many would believe has, has ended, has ended. He spends no more time with the crowds. He is with his disciples now. The themes of their spiritual growth and his death and resurrection become more and more clear in his words to them. John's presentation of the Last Supper is in chapter 13, 1 through 30. This video will be about part of that event where the Lord washes the disciples' feet, verses 1 through 17. So, the event described in this passage in the Gospel of John is indeed certainly the Lord's Supper. Luke 22, 15, 16, and 17 clearly shows that what we call the Last Supper was a Passover meal. And in John 13, 1, we know that the foot washing took place before the Feast of Passover. Even so, the Apostle John's description of that event is very different from that found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the Synoptic Gospels, they emphasize the theme of the Lord's Supper. And actually, John hardly mentions the actual Lord's Supper itself. Instead, John records teachings that were delivered by the Lord Jesus at that event, teachings not revealed at all in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So again, this video, the Lord Jesus washes the feet of the disciples, chapter 13, 1 through 17. This event occurred right before Friday. Friday is Passover, and that's the 15th of the month of Nisan. Now, you have to remember that according to the Jewish system of reckoning, of calculating day and date, each day began at sunset. So, the end of Thursday is sunset on what we would call Thursday evening. The events described in this passage include the preparation before they ate the Passover lamb, which was to be eaten on the, on the Feast of Passover, the 15th of Nisan again. So, according to Mark 14, 12 and Luke 22, 15, the Lord Jesus and his disciples celebrated the Passover together, and they would have eaten the Passover at what we would call Thursday evening, but for them it was the beginning of Friday, because in Jewish reckoning, the day ends at sundown. And so, in our passage, the sun has not yet set. It's still Thursday. The Passover feast cannot yet start because it's still Thursday. The disciples of the Lord Jesus had just finished with all the preparations for the Passover meal according to the law and their customs. In Mark 14, 12 through 16, we read about how they found a room to celebrate that meal. But actually, the preparations weren't quite finished because among the twelve disciples, no one had humbled himself to wash their feet. Now, foot washing in Jewish culture. Normally, the act of washing feet was the duty of slaves or very lowly domestic servants. But apparently, although a room was provided, no slaves or servants were provided for them to do this humble, lowly, despised task. So, that oversight became an opportunity for the Lord Jesus to deliver two very important lessons. He taught about spiritual cleansing, the cleansing of the soul, verses 8 through 10, as well as humility, putting other people ahead of yourself, verses 12 through 17. Both lessons 
focus on his cross, in fact. Cleansing, this cleansing of the soul, that happened on his cross. Likewise, the most extraordinary humility happened on his cross. In other words, it's fitting that this towel story is a prelude to the story of his death, for both with the cross and with the towel, there is cleansing, cleansing of the soul or cleansing of feet, and there is an example of humility, the great humility of the Lord Jesus dying on the cross, putting the interests of others ahead of his own, dying on the cross, and the humility of washing someone's feet. In this event, we can see a, a sign of love, a symbol of the cross, and an example of humility. So in this way, the story of the Lord washing his disciples' feet becomes a transition in the Gospel of John between evangelism, the cleansing of the soul, which has been emphasized up to this point, and discipleship, the life of humble service, putting the interests of others ahead of one's own interests. And that's emphasized in the following chapters. Thus, the event of foot washing is an appropriate transition because in it evangelism is combined with cleansing. Discipleship is combined with the theme of humility, the humility that is required to be a true disciple, a true follower of Jesus Christ. Chapter 13, verse 1. Now, before the feast of Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, so that he might depart out of this world to the Father, loving his own in the world, he loved them to the end. Well, the expression, now before the Feast of Passover, is, is about that's when the foot washing took place. After the foot washing, Thursday ended and Friday began, because the sun went down and the Passover feast would take place. Now, there's an expression here, he loved them to the end. To the end here, the Greek is ace telos. It can indeed mean to the end, but it can also mean to the fullest, to the uttermost. The Apostle John, remember, often used expressions that could have two meanings. We call that ambiguity, two meanings at once. And one classic example of ambiguity in the Gospel of John is the word anothen in chapter 3, verse 3. It can mean again, Remember, the text is being born again. But anothen can also mean from above, which would make that expression mean born from above. You see, both the translation again and the translation from above work perfectly well. So the ambiguity of this word contributes to John's message. Well, again, we have some ambiguity here in this expression, ace telos. It can mean to the end, and it can mean to the fullest. Which meaning did he intend there? Or perhaps both meanings are intended here, because John likes to, likes to do that in his gospel. In chapter 12, verse 23, we read that the Lord Jesus understood that his hour has come so that he might depart from this world to the Father. Before that event, for example, in chapter 2, verse 4, and chapter 7, verse 8, we also read the expression, his hour has not yet come. Well, the hour referred to here, it is approaching. The hour for his cross and his glory is near. We read that his hour has come so that he might depart out of this world to the Father. And this word depart, it's an interesting word. The Greek word is metabino. And it was also used in chapter 5, verse 24, where it was translated transferred. And so, that also is a good translation for this word here. The hour has come so that he might be transferred out of this world to the Father. Chapter 13, verse 2. And supper having been served, the devil already having put into Judas Simon Iscariot's heart that he would betray him. So, in this verse, Satan's plans enter Judas' heart. In verse 27, Satan himself enters into Judas. John mentioned Judas Iscariot to remind us that the death of the Lord Jesus was something certain. 
so, and so that we would realize that the Lord Jesus' humility was so great that he could wash the defeat of Judas Iscariot, who would betray him. Chapter 13, verse 3. Jesus, knowing that the Father has given to him all things into his hands, and that he went out from God, and he is going to God. So with full awareness of his glorious status, the Lord Jesus washed their feet and headed for the cross. As one having such great power, great rights, he could have destroyed Satan right there at that moment, but he chose the path of humility and love and obedience to God the Father. The Lord Jesus had no doubt about his position in God. Perhaps that made humble obedience possible. <laughs> do we understand our position in Christ? If we really do, there will be no task too humble for us, and we will never need to guard our dignity or status, because all the important dignity and status we have is in Christ. Chapter 13, verse 4 gets up, this is the Lord Jesus, of course, he gets up from the supper and sets down his clothes, and taking a towel, he wrapped himself in it. Well, they reclined on benches for this sort of a meal, not all the time, but for special meals, they would recline on benches. They would lean on their left elbows. Each head would be close to the table. All is ready. But the Lord doesn't proceed with the Passover meal. Instead, he, to no doubt, to everyone's astonishment, he gets up from the supper and he sets down his clothes. It's quite startling. The towel, as we have in our English translation, is, well, it's a lention, it's the Greek word. It was actually a long cloth that would be worn by slaves as clothing. It would be long enough so that after it was wrapped around the body as clothing, there was extra cloth that the slave would have used for his work, in this case, drying feet. It seems that sometimes slaves were not given the dignity of proper clothing, and they were not given the dignity of separate towels to do their work with. The slave's clothing, so to speak, is a long work cloth. He was cleaning with his clothing, or he was clothed in a work rag, work cloth. You can put it either way. And the slave wasn't expected to object. This was the nature of life as a slave. And that's the kind of cloth or towel that the Lord Jesus put on. He put on the clothing, if you can call it that, the clothing of a literal slave. Clothing that was considered, no doubt, contemptible by both Jews and Gentiles. The Lord Jesus' disciples, they saw that linen cloth there. They saw that there was a basin and water there. They had the opportunity to get up and wash the feet of the Lord Jesus and their friends, refreshing them, but no one was willing. They were willing to discuss who is the greatest among them in Luke 22:24, but they were not willing to humble themselves to serve in a way that they despised. Chapter 13, verse 5. Then he puts water into the wash basin, and he began to wash the feet of the disciples and to wipe them with the towel in which he was wrapped. For them, and for us too, this event was shocking and confusing. There were Jews that w would say that even Jewish slaves should not be forced to wash people's feet. Such a despicable task is suitable only for a foreign slave. But adult Jewish men, even slaves, some would say, should not be asked to do such despicable work. God became incarnate and humbled himself until he, he became 
like a despicable slave who cleanses all the filth from his disciples' feet. Now, do not let it be said that he did this even though he is the Most High. Actually, the glory of God and this great humility are not contradictory. The Lord Jesus revealed God through this event. In verse 118, it says, The only unique Son who is upon the bosom of the Father, that one has explained him. Our glorious God is also humble. Definition of humble? Putting the interests of others ahead of oneself. Wow. The Lord Jesus did that in washing the disciples' feet. He did that on going to the cross and dying on the cross, too. He put the interests of others ahead of himself. True humility. We might look at the extraordinary humility of Abigail in 1 Samuel 25, 41. Let me tell you the story about Rabbi Ishmael coming home from worship. His mother wanted to wash his feet, but he refuses her because such a task is too lowly for his mother, he feels. His mother feels that it's an honor to wash a rabbi's feet, and so she takes the case to a court of rabbis. 